Good evening, welcome to a special episode, a bonus episode of Amateur Logic. I'm George. I'm Tommy. And tonight we've got our 45th anniversary MFJ wrap-up video. Yeah, we, we went for their uh, 45th anniversary day in the park, had a big time, got mm -hmm. a lot of video to share with you. We do. We, uh, we've kind of prepared most of it, got it ready, and uh, we're just going to dive in and watch it tonight and see what we got. It's going to be a, a longer show because we had a lot of stuff. Uh, you know, a lot of it hit the cutting room floor, but we still ended up with about 90 minutes worth of video. 90 minutes worth of fun video. Yeah, and by the time we sandwich in the BS in between the segments... We could be up into the two-hour range. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we'll hit that. But Okay, uh, well, let's see yeah. how it works out. Let's see. Well, the, you know, when, when you got there, what was the first thing you saw, Tommy? Do you remember? Uh, first thing I saw were the tailgaters out front. we got quite a few tailgaters here at MFJ today. Got the early comers look like they got the shade tree. But we got some others out here, out in the parking lot as well. And quite a few set up, a lot more than I, than I expected. Looks like people came from all over. I see tags from Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, Texas. Got one here from Minnesota as well. MFJ had their usual setup that they use at HamFest out in front of their main office building here. There was also a vendor here, Main Trading Company, came and set up, and they were running some really great discounts on MFJ products. The doors were open, and uh, they were giving tours of the MFJ facility, as well as the ones that were at a different location. And that was outside in front. I saw that same stuff. Yeah. That was the MFJ factory right there, the building in the background. But that's only one plant. They have several buildings all over Starkville, Mississippi. For the different parts of the different companies yeah unfortunately i didn't get to make it to the other ones i took the tour in that one and mm -hmm. there was so much to see there um i wish i could have came on uh, friday as well but i just wasn't able to because of work but it, it was very interesting yeah now we didn't want to repeat a lot of stuff that that we've done before and we always try to avoid that doesn't always work out for us we end up repeating a lot of things but you know, I mainly wanted to see what was different between this time at MFJ and the last time we shot mm -hmm. a lot of video. Ten years ago, we attended the 35th anniversary. Yeah. I got a lot of good video there. That's some of the most watched uh, episodes of Amateur Logic. If you go back, uh, well, ten years mm -hmm. in the archives there, and I would encourage you to go back and watch the first series of mfj factory tours we also had a high gain tour uh, a metal shop a metal shop tour an ameritron tour uh, all of those companies are still there plus a little more and you'll get some real good information on how things are done there but what we tried to capture this time is the stuff that was different so mm -hmm. go back and watch those uh, earlier videos from 10 years ago and then add this to it and then you got a, a current picture and you got of a lot of watching on. to do because there's a lot of stuff there to see oh it was it was well the first thing we're going to look at here is the mfj factory itself uh, our friend richard stubbs went through uh, gave us a, a quick tour hit some highlights there inside the mfj plant few of the things we saw before but uh, some of the stuff was new there Mm -hmm. So uh, let's take a look at that first. Here's our friend Richard Stubbs at MFJ. Hi, Richard. Hey, George. How are you? It's good to see you again. Good Momentous occasion, huh? Oh, it is. You know, we we did this uh, 10 years ago and then five years ago, and we're here. It's the 45th anniversary. Not much has changed. Just a whole lot of more excitement, a lot more people this year for sure. Yeah. Uh, Fridays are big and wonderful and going crazy, and we've given about – eight tours today already so uh, this will be our last one right uh, but maybe more today. tomorrow yep. <laughs> so here we are at headquarters the original way it started right here the cwf2 yep. built in 1972 sold as a kit for nine dollars and 95 cents a wired unit is 14.95 mr jew took out a tiny one by one little ad in national radio magazine which is now 
QST magazine, obviously. And uh, that's the humble beginnings of MFJ. 45 years later, we're back here making all kinds of things, which we're about to show you, George. Well, let's go have a look. Let's go have a look. Ten years ago when you were here, I, I think we were maybe doing automatic tuners. You but, were. So yep. it's still the same, except it's a very competitive field, obviously, and we're making a whole lot of them. So you'll see throughout the plant that we're doing a lot of uh, automatic tuner work uh, elsewhere besides right here with Tronic and Maddie. This is the blank PC board as it got through the surface mount machine, which we're going to see the surface mount machine run again. And then Teronica here is doing the through hole parts. So you can see her winding some toroids right here. You're winding those by hand? Those are the ones you wind by hand? Just my one. Oh, you don't use them? You don't use a machine for that? <laughs> okay. Wow. So we're still winding some toroids by hand. I learn something new every day. So here's the board as she stuffed it. This has not been soldered, so you can see all the capacitors are loose. This is going to go across a wave solder machine all at one time and solder all of the connections. And then we're going to test this in the PC board format, and you'll see that in the next uh, process over on the next line. And then we are going to bring it back out, and Maddie does the work of putting it into the metal cabinet. So we're going to turn around here. These PC boards have been tested by Kyle, who's got his little initials right here. And so this is ready to be put into the metal cabinet. And then we're going to take it over here where Maddie's doing that point-to-point -point soldering work right here. And then she's doing all the hardware, and she's prepping it for the final test, which will be done by one of our techs uh, back here. So what is that she was doing right then with the... Uh Maddie, explain that to me because I don't know. What, what, what was that uh, juice you were putting in there? Oh, this the, this the glue that hold the, um, oh. the nut on tight. Oh, oh. it won't screw off. Lock tight. Right, the lock yes. tight. Uh -huh. Yeah, we, wanna, yeah. we don't want to have loose hardware right. in your tuners when they come out to you, so okay. that's what she's It'll doing there. Out. If you don't put this on, it will come out. <laughs> 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 All right, so then you come down here. And you'll see all the different automatic tuners that we build. Of course, the most popular one we have now, George, is the uh, little 200 watt, 20,000 memory tuner. This is comes with the interface cable. I think that's the one Tommy uses. And a two-year warranty. Oh. So it's the okay. first product of the MFJs that we put a two-year warranty on. Now, Ameritron has the AL80B that has a two-year mm -hmm. warranty. That's the most trouble-free amp there is. This is a trouble-free tuner. So we sell this to you. You still got two years on it. All, all, and uh, the wire comes with it, all for 159.95. And Pretty that's amazing. that's really fast tuner. Really too. fast it's tuner, super fast. Then you go all the way up to the 998, which is the legal limit tuner at 6.99. And then there's a big brother of that that goes outside at the antenna. That's the remote tuner. Mm -hmm. That's up to 769 dollars. Now right over here you got little bit, and you got Joyce over here building the final product putting it all together, getting it put into the boxes, getting it ready to be shipped out uh, to the customer. So this, so is, this uh, is one of the remote This ones. is the big remote tuner right here. And we got a guy that's testing these products back here. This is a loop tuner. That's the one that Mr. Jew likes to play with. Your wire goes straight to it, to the capacitor. Right. And then you play with a, a, a loop, a giant loop outside. Uh, we got more remote, uh, more automatic tuners being packed here. Here's the one with the cable that I told you about. Here's the more automatic tuners. There's a digital watt meter up here, manual tuners, remote tuners with the bias T. Uh, your big ear that's displayed outside is up there, getting ready to be packed. Dry dummy load. Yep. There's your dry dummy load. Sell that to the Navy and hams all over the world. 1.5 kW? That, that is that is a dry 1.5. That'll handle uh, 1,500 watts for about 20 seconds. Yeah, yeah. So it's real brief, but 200 watts continuously. Well, I'm going to have to get one of those. There you go. Everybody's got to have a dummy load. That's what we transmit exactly. into. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, John here is one of our testers. He does a, he's one of our technicians that checks out different products. Today he's working on the SWR analyzer. Of course, this is the 269C. Ten years ago when you came, George, this only uh, covered uh, 1.8 to uh, 170 megahertz yep. and then 415 to 470. Now it covers 530 kilohertz 
to 230 megahertz, so it included the 220 megahertz band as well. We do have a version that goes down to 0.47 megahertz. Yes, that's the CM version. There's a, mil oh, a maritime yeah. version uh, okay. that'll cover some of the marine frequencies as well. Now behind you, this is where we build all the little niche CW rigs, the sideband uh, 12 watt rigs, and uh, we have a multiple, a uh, lot of QRP rigs that we sell. We're not trying to compete with our buddies at ICOM or Kenwood or Yesu. We're just trying to make our little niche uh, QRP rigs like, like Mr. Jew likes. He likes to play with 40 meter CW, as you know. Yeah. Then, of course, Mirage is built on this line as well. Uh, we make the, the best selling ones at Ameritron. Those are the 10 watt in the 25 watt in and a 50 watt in 160 watt amplifiers. George, you'll recognize this product. We we, oh, yeah. we did something with this at the uh, on uh, Amateur Logic testing some arcing transformers one time. This is to find uh, faulty transformer lines in your neighborhood. Or better yet, you notice this is called the sound gun. Now. Yeah. You know what you can do with this? What can you do with that? You can listen to crickets making love in your backyard. So that's one of them that we do. This is also an 852 little dipole antenna, but it's also mounted on a tri-element beam. That's the 1767, and that's also a power line noise finder. Now, back to those automatic tuners. Uh, of course, all the radios right up there, Wayne, that we build, all the sideband and CW rigs that you'll see. Now, we got Kyle here. Kyle has uh, got the wave soldered board out of the uh, wave solder department and these are those automatic tuners and he's uh, test, uh, checking up on the solder connections so there is they're not always perfect out of the wave solder machine but he tells me 15 minutes or so he spends on it or sometimes it's perfect but there may be a connection he has to touch up like he's doing right now that comes out of there the way we test those boards we put them in the metal cabinet he wire clips all the important wires in there and he can treat it just like it's sitting in the metal cabinet. So that's how he tests the PC board outside of the box. Okay. Now we got a little 1204 USB interface activity going on down here. We were talking some PSK31 uh, through the radio, the ICOM radio here. And this is the little USB interface working with the computer. We have a little PSK conversation going on on this line. This is a product that's built next door. All right, around the corner we got a big line. That, oops, sorry Robert. Two people handle over 120 products. Mostly Morse code related, but Jason here and his lovely bride Peanut, <laughs> his co-worker down here, they, they build and test all of this product, 120 different products. So you'll see PC boards everywhere, up and down the aisles. And these are mostly Morse code related products, uh, George, but we also have the noise canceling antenna box. So this is uh, used to, where you have a uh, electric fence in your that, neighborhood. That really works. It, it does. I have used it and it was uh, pretty amazing. That's the dusty model. Yep. But you know, that, that is what we use to clean up your signal uh, well, take out a signal that's causing a problem with your radio. So Jason and uh, Peanut do all of this work in here. A lot of, lot of different boards going on, the USB interface, keyers, uh, other products that are being built right here. She's building that board. This is the 1026 board right here, so you can see the internal guts right there. That is the noise canceling uh, antenna box. Wow, and this is before the uh, this is all before the soldering, soldering, of course. She's yeah. just hand stuffed all the parts. Then this will go across the wave solder machine. Now the other line, these two lovely ladies right down here, Alma and Yvette, they are handling all the small dummy loads that you saw up front, mm -hmm. uh, and also the smaller tuners. These are the uh, switched inductor type uh, smaller tuners that we do. So we got a lady that does all this intricate wiring here. These are each a, a segment of the bands as a tap uh, selection of the coil that you're turning. Of course, uh, Bob Heil mentioned this on right. his show, Ham Nation, your show. Uh -huh. And we're, we're making these coils also for the pine board project that I'll show you next door. 
uh, Alma here is doing the final testing on these tuners and you'll notice that she has her own SWR analyzers here for testing, her own power supply, her own tuner that she builds. I guess she trusts her own equipment is what I'm saying here. <laughs> and her dry dummy loads right here. So she's doing all the final testing. Of course to the bird standard, Wayne, everything to the bird standard. That doesn't mean we're perfect to the bird, but that means we're going to get as close as we possibly can. Because that bird is the industry standard, right? Uh, well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> That's what everybody wants, but right. doesn't want to pay for We're running for into another tour here. Kind of expensive. <laughs> we used to use Barker and Williamson. I hate, uh, I hate to call out people, but sometimes we had to cut out the middleman, and we started making. And I believe this was not here, George, ten years ago. Uh, I think you had just maybe started maybe it, just and started. it was a secret. Well, we got it's, some film it, of it. It's so, not a secret yeah. anymore. <laughs> we're, we're making these coils over at our metal shop. We have a machine that melts that Delrin material, helps form the coil and, 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 and support it, and it wraps this uh, winding. Now this is the one for the 811. Yep. That is the one you're using at the pine board project. That's used in the 811 amplifier as, as well. So what these are used for is to make contacts, as we saw on the other line, and then put your inductor switch on there and it goes in those small tuners mm -hmm. to become the inductor. Now the rest of this line is our old famous product, the MFJ 259C and of course the 269C. This is the guts of it. Notice the black board. You know, I don't think you remember that part. No, I don't. I don't remember. So now it's on black instead of the green epoxy. This is the guts, the battery cover. This one's been tested and it's ready to go. Uh, 530 kilohertz to 230 megahertz. And then uh, the other one, the 269, does the VHF, UH, uh, UHF also. Yep. So we're seeing this all backwards. The, ch the chassis is done over here, the meter harness, the hardware shell. And we've got a lady that retired. She's gone now. I don't get to joke about her, but she retired. She came back because she was having so much fun building these guys. So she sits there and builds that part. Then she turns around to her other desk and she puts the PC board into the metal cabinet. Now look at all that little parts right there. There's a lot that can go wrong <laughs> or can go right. But this one's been tested, it's ready to go, go into the metal cabinet and then get the final test. And then at this point, is if it has to be some kind of correction done, then Henry's got all these little dinky tiny, we can't even see that Wayne, I don't think. Can you see that through there? All right, so then uh, not much else has changed. We go down here and we're building our big components, George. All of our big capacitors, our slinky maker. This is the roller inductor for all the different roller inductors that we build. So cutting out the middleman again, we have made roller inductors and big capacitors for all of our big tuners. And you'll see that down this line. All of this stuff comes together from our metal shop. And the only thing we do not make is that little wheel right there. So every little piece is made by us except for that. We buy that. And all these pieces are made by our metal shop. The little brass, they can punch out steel, uh -huh. um, aluminum, pre-painted aluminum, fiberglass, as you see on these runners, these support rods. So these are being all put together to build these capacitors and these roller inductors to support this big tuner line. And of course, we've we've knocked it down to um, all the way down to 100, uh, 125 picofarad capacitor. We're not building those real tiny ones. We're still getting those from China, but those those bigger ones we're building them. And uh, Annie builds also the slinky. <laughs> I like to talk about the slinky. <laughs> it, that reminds me of being a kid. Doesn't uh, yeah, it looks yeah. just like one. Yeah, it's a slinky. Remember walking those down the stairs? Yeah. Yeah, so that's used in our roller inductor. And all these are, are capacitor parts over Those here? Those are capacitor parts over there. This is a, a finished roller inductor as it's done out of, from Annie. All those are made from our metal shops. And when you get to tour that, you can see the tumblers working. And they're making all of this. The fiberglass, except for the coil. The coil is made right over there. And all this is going to go into some big tuner that rides over here. Now here's one, George, this is that big one, 
that goes in the ATR30. That's a little more heftier fiberglass, mm -hmm. an edge wound silver plated roller inductor. The contact wheel still makes contact on the inside of the coil, but this is used to do over 3,000 watts on 160 meters in the ATR30. Tom Rouse, W8JI, I think y'all have talked to him mm -hmm. before. He's the original Maritron engineer. He did the AL1500 and he designed the ATR30 to handle real power. Now these look like the type of coils I'm used to seeing in broadcast transmitters. That, yeah. The edge wound heavy gauge take real, a lot of current. Real power, yeah. yeah. So that's uh, that's what, and he's a big broadcaster guy too. He does he did a lot of that, a lot of uh, consulting for those guys too. Mm -hmm. So he's over in Georgia. Most of our engineers are off site, but we do have some right here in the plant. Obviously, mm -hmm. Mr. Jew is the biggest one yep. of them. <laughs> so then we're building these big tuners. You know, nothing's really changed. The 989 has been popular for, gosh, it's been around forever. Uh, as the 989, as a 989B, as a C, a D, this is the D model now. So it changed the, the, the size of the cabinet a little bit, made it more up, raised the uh, inductor up off the uh, cabinet, got some vent holes underneath it. And then they use now two gain capacitors. I think it's the ones that are right behind us there. And they're tied together. Yeah, that was pretty neat. Mr. Jew. Uh, Here they are inside. Showed me one of those earlier. Right there, together. And then that big, giant ballon in the back, too. Now, we have a bigger tuner than that. We have a 2,500-watt continuous carrier one on the MFJ line that uses that Ameritron inductor. Yeah. And as we step down... I, I I really like to show this old thing. I joke with Anu every time when she's sitting here. I tell her, I said, this thing's 45 years old. She inherited it from Mr. Jew. Well, of course, this is an old 949 chassis. And you got all your wire clips. And it's still used by us to test meter PC boards. So the meter PC board sits down in here. You clip all the wires in. And you can treat that board like it's handling this meter. Well, it is handling this meter. Yeah. And then you can test and calibrate this board based on that meter reading. So it's really an important doodad, even though it's gathered years of dust. Uh, <laughs> and looks like a little rosin in the process, exactly. too. Exactly. And we, of course, use the bird meter to test and calibrate those mm -hmm. boards. Uh, right behind you, I want to introduce you to uh, Chad Butler. I never get to introduce him much when we do these tours. He is the production manager for MFJ. He's the one that keeps all this, these lines rolling. Chad, come on in here and meet George. You... Yeah, I met him earlier. I was going to run the machine for y'all. Oh, good, good. So we're going we're to go see the surface mount machine, and Chad's going to get that going for us. You can also run the, the wave solder for us real quick. All right. So our final testing area is right here. You see one of those big automatic tuners being tested by the AO82. Well, it's not being tested right now because our guys are gone. They went home for the day. But that thing will be cranked up and put some heat out. And then our stitch and wind machine, uh, this is going to take those little toroids that you saw. Teronica actually hand stuff in the smaller one, but she comes back here and, and puts the uh, wire into the stitch and wind machine, pulls that wire up and down. Oh, Chad will do, Chad will do something. Good. Uh, yeah, this is a really amazing. I don't think amazing. you saw this one. We did. Oh, you did? I want to see it again. Now, Teronica can make it jam. I don't know how fast uh, Chad can make Somebody it go. Had to teach her. Oh, so you did it. Oh, you are pretty good at it. <laughs> See, he's got a counter. You just set it for what size coil if you can adjust these. And pull it out. And then we have different needles for different sizes. Depending on which so who built this? We bought it. But you modified all this to, uh, to make it work for us. I think it's called Hustler. Wow. And then we just spread them out like that. There you go. Ready to roll. 40 through 15 meter loop up here. And also your 10 to 30 megahertz loop. Most of these are being used by hams that are in condos and apartments. And a lot of uh, overseas, obviously, Jap Japanese, the Germans, they are living on top of each other. They have no outdoor antenna, so they use these outside on their condos. The new thing is those SDR. Uh, receive loops like you see here with the preamp built on it. You you tested one on right. on ham uh, on your show Amateur Logic, mm -hmm. and uh, so a lot of guys are using these now for a low noise receive loop, and then you use a transmit antenna somewhere else. 
Then you see the loop production here uh, going up and down. So these are these are welded at the antenna shop, and then they come over here and they put in the uh, rotor parts, uh, the rotor plates in here, and build the motor assembly, the PC board, and so on. And then all of our small antennas are made here, but next door at Cushcraft and High Gain, it just makes sense to have the big aluminum tubing type antennas all in one location. So, but we do the two meter five eighths wave, the two meter quarter wave, the nice little screwdriver manual antenna. You tap the coil by changing the tube up and down. And then our feed through panels. So we got a, our metal shop again is responsible for making this jig that we put in all of our connectors. So for instance, this is one that's got almost every kind of connector you can imagine. And I think this is new from 10 years ago. And then you put this in your window, you cut it down to size, and you put the insulation material around it, and you've got all your connections on the inside and the outside, and you don't have to drill a hole through your house. So that works really well. Of course, all your G5RVs are made on this line, George. The big ear, this is the one that's outside. You got the two telescopic whips out here. You got 33 feet of radiating power and you clip that on top of a PVC little holder and you've got a portable antenna that's that's good 40 through 6 meters and then we build those RFI isolators on this line we talked about that you did a segment on RF right. uh, all the different tools these are ferrite beads put on that RG8 uh, Teflon coax and then that goes all into a PVC container so you're running a long coax line you're running it into this connector and running it back out on this, and it chokes off any RF that may be traveling down your coax line. Chad's going to show off the wave solder room. I think he's going to turn that on. Turn the fluxer on. You got the wave on right there. So this little conveyor belt will carry all the way up through these two preheaters, and it'll carry it right over the wave there. Uh, Solder that board. That's the solder bar. Whenever it gets low, we just drop another solder bar in there. And it'll melt it. That's how we solder all of our boards. I don't know if you can see this fluxer right here, but that solder will not stick to that board if there's no any, not any flux on it. Mm -hmm. We had to go back and check some of the little solder, a little couple of little shorts and stuff on there. Oh. A lot quicker than doing it by hand. Yeah, I don't think I can solder quite that fast. <laughs> Cornell Dubler days, 1940s, Mr. Jew says. That was the original manufacturer of the CD rotator and the original ham rotator. And now we use that for making those trap dipoles right there. Now, when you go to Cushcraft and High Gain next door, you see a lot of old machines that look just like that, military grade. And the old machines work great. So we still use them in a lot of our plants. You'll see some of the Maritron. Cushcraft high gain and over here. So that's used as a intricate wiring system for those wire dipoles. <laughs> well. Ten trailer loads of equipment came from Lincoln, Nebraska to here when we bought high gain. And, and we only bought the ham radio division. We did not buy the military and the commercial division. Of course, George, some old standby products here. This is neat. It's a telegraph key built into a light switch, a light switch yeah. cover. So that was an idea of, of one of our Columbus hams, K1 man, Austin man, is going to be one of the VEs testing tomorrow. Mm -hmm. He came up with that little doodad. Mr. Jew liked it so much he decided to build it. So, And then the old code tutor, code reader, there's the board. This is the unit in its full play right here. And I got that really slow right now. I think I popped that down to about six words a minute. So that's still normally, too fast can, for me. You can move it up, and the 13 sounds a little bit better. So we also make this as a reader that you hold up to your radio speaker, and it'll decode, provided it's a good S5 yep. signal. It can't clean up a sloppy fist, as Mr. G always says, <laughs> which there's a lot of them out there apparently. But this lady makes all the cable assemblies as well. Now, the surface mount machine, we're going to let Chad show that off. So Chad, what are we going to do here? 
we're going to go through the MFJ surface mount process. All right, this is a 269C, pretty popular analyzer board. Mm -hmm. Each time we uh, design a board, we have to buy a stencil for it. And back here, we keep up hundreds of stencils for each board that we that we do. Every one we design, we have to have a stencil. We mount that stencil in this little holder here, and we actually converted this to a manual. We used to have an automatic machine, but this manual machine is a lot easier to, to, to control. So you just throw it in there like that. You got all, all these right. settings. If it's off, you can set it right there. Do that right there. That's the paste. So once it gets paste on there, we can throw it in this machine. And I got four boards in here. Let me hit this real quick. So it's recognizing the boards. Hopefully it don't mess up on me. Got to get these judicial marks exactly perfect. Okay, it's got 1,200 parts, and it's placing eight at a t six or eight at a time. And you can sit there and see how they're counting down. And you got a, a head right here that's got eight fingers. It picks up eight parts at a time and puts eight on. Wow. So it takes probably 10 minutes to place, to place these 1,200 parts. So all the components are on these uh, tape and reel type of... Yes, sir. Each one of these components, there's a light on the machine that tells you if the component's being used. So all these uh, magazines are filled up with all the parts from the 269C. And sometimes there'll be an error, it'll light up red or something, we'll have to go replace the part or whatever. Right. And these shelves back here contain all the parts that we use at MFJ in the surface mount. So after about 10 or 12 minutes, this thing gets through. You got these boards over here. This is how they look when they come out. So there's just components on there. There's some bigger components like this relay we actually put on by hand. Yeah. Because there's just one. It's just easier to throw it on real quick. And the paste is still wet at yeah. this point. This stuff can fall off. It's just sitting on there. So once we get everything aligned, make sure there's no problems, we'll put it in this oven, which is turned off right now. But it, once it goes through the oven, it comes out down here. And everything's soldered perfectly. So, so we'll take a look at it down here again, make sure that there's not any problems before we actually stuff the boards. So that's it. All right. Cool. So that's a new... Uh a new machine down there from the last time I yeah, did a recording here. It was the old uh, <laughs> single, picking place. Yeah, that one's probably 10 times faster than the old machine. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot more accurate. You know, Mr. Jew's concept of, of uh, ham radio project building and all of that, is, it's been kind of interesting because in the, in the plant itself, you've got people that are just one-man lines. Right. And Tim Moore, who's been here 30 years, he builds all of this product, Wayne. Uh, low pass filters, VHF, UHF, uh, SWR watt meters and such. But he always told me, he thought, if I can take my people and put them on an island and give them everything they need and they can still do their job, well, that was what he wanted to do. So Tim Moore been doing that for 30 years. He builds it, he tests it, and he uh, totally finishes it. So that's his little island right there. Well, wow. so... He, he goes through every step on that, the particular products that he builds. He builds his own product. He's the builder. He's the tester. He, he completes it completely. So, and that's, we have a lot of that in here in this line, uh, several individual lines that do their own product. And it's kind of like, even though Mr. Jude did that 45 years ago, we're still sort of doing it, but with more people. Yeah. Individual products being built by individuals. So it's the, the old garage mentality still alive. <laughs> hey, if it works. Don't fix no. it. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> well, George, I appreciate y'all coming again. This has been a, a pleasure touring the facilities again and oh, meeting yeah. all the people. And, of course, you're going to get to talk to Mr. Jew personally, too, as well, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Yep. And looking forward to that. And uh, as a matter of fact, I've already talked to him. Oh, okay. And we got a great interview. Oh, that's awesome. So, uh, yeah, it's... 
it's uh, going to be fun to get back at it all this stuff and uh, see see what we come up with and what it's cutting room for. But I think most of this we're going to use. Yes, and you know it's it's neat. We go to Dayton together, mm-hmm. and we know how big ham radio is there. But it's neat to just see it in a home style type setting. This right. many people come from all over these different states. Colorado, some of these guys yeah. drove down from Pennsylvania oh, there's a guy to from come here, see from Australia. Yeah, from Australia yeah. to come see MFJ and his plants and and let us show it off to him yep. for the weekend. So it's a really g- great day. Yep. Richard, thanks Thank again. you so much, George. It was a pleasure. Pretty cool stuff. Pretty cool stuff. That's you know, it's always fun to go through there and see what's going on. Some of that stuff is the same as it was ten years ago. Some of it's not. Yeah. It's it's just absolutely astounding to me how many products come out of that mm-hmm. building right there. It's just absolutely amazing. It's like and is how many products they have yeah. over two thousand. And that's just one of the plants. You know, they all the antenna uh, manufacturers MFJ has are in another plant. Right. Uh, Ameritron is in another one. The amplifier company, uh, the metal shop where they make all the metal pieces they need. Is in another one. Yeah, I'd, I'd really hope to get over there and see that. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, maybe maybe in the next 45 years I'll make it over that one. Yeah. I want to thank uh, Wayne, KG5RE. Y'all know Wayne. Wayne's, oh, yeah. Wayne's been on here a lot. He uh, played the part of the cameraman on um, on any of the video that, that I got and, and brought back from the event. I uh, appreciate him helping with that. He, You know, he did it last time as well. Uh, I think... The last time he did it, it was probably the first time he had ever done anything with us. And I said, here, here's the camera. Here's how you zoom it, <laughs> you know, <laughs> see what you can do. That was and, like on the job training. Yep, yep, it was. And it probably is every time because we just throw them out there, yeah. you know, no, no fo- forethought. You yeah. know, just <laughs> here, we're, we're going to shoot something. Yeah, he's always a good sport to help out, though. Yeah. Yeah, he is. Well, you saw another one of our buddies there, didn't you? I did. I saw a lot of buddies. All right. Well, I ran into our friend Arnie. We've seen Arnie on here quite a few times. It's good to see you. Hi, good to see you, Tom. And uh, George. Time. Yeah, it is. Yeah, see. yeah. Have, it, you it, see, have you seen my uh, fine decoration here? Yeah, you were looking, you're looking good. Yeah. That, that bling <laughs> caught my eye when you came through the sun over here a while ago. Yeah. And George gave me the little gold uh, gold connector the you sent for it. Yeah, yeah that's pretty, I really that's appreciate it. I should have wore it. I was kind of in a hurry to get out of here. Uh-huh. Yesterday I got tied up at work, and I wasn't able to leave as early as I thought, and I'm lucky I even got my suitcase and stuff when I came. Okay. So I wanted to check with you. I saw you had a pretty nice little crowd in there testing today. Yeah, we had about 13 people and uh, almost all of them passed and we had several upgrades from general to extras really good they did a good job and uh, we had prepared very well so i think everything uh, flowed very smoothly oh good and, and i'm sorry I, I didn't introduce walt here what's your your call signs walt af5 kq okay. and uh, you hang out with this guy uh, unfortunately yes i'm in the Lowndes county club with arnie and several other characters Oh, okay, character, son. Yeah, I've, I've met several of the guys in your club. You got a nice club. Yeah. So anyway, so how many, how many total did you have testing? Thirteen. Oh wow, that's great. We were expecting fifty, but I think many canceled out. Yeah. yeah but we were prepared for fifty. <laughs> yeah, well that's well, that's good. Thirteen's not a bad turnout. No, I don't think so. And we had a young guy. He mi- missed the first time, so now he's doing the second time. We do an extra for him, you know, to see if he can pass a technician. I I want to say also, Walt is our carpenter, club carpenter. He, you know, when we put all the ugly tubing up for air conditioners and so on he comes afterwards and cover them up oh yeah really good job <laughs> <laughs> so you got your work cut out for you huh uh, yeah he worked that out for me <laughs> he didn't give me a budget and i haven't submitted the bill yet so he might not be happy oh, yeah well i'll just bring that at the end 
Okay. Yeah, well, cool. It's good to see you as always, and uh, we're, I'm still working on the competition here. Yeah, but I have removed uh, yeah, seventy-five percent of yeah, it. You know, I noticed that. That's why it, I didn't quite recognize. Every it. time when I make it shorter, my wife gets happier. I don't know why. Yeah, I, I know. I know how that is. All Mine's right. the same way. All right. Good to see you, Tommy. Yeah, always. Yeah. Thank yes, you so much. Yes, you too. And it's great to meet you, Walt. Nice to meet you. No, we're having just a little bit too much fun there. Oh yeah, the whole the whole event was like that while I was there. It was just a yeah. great time. Arnie is is making. I think he's made better use of that gold PL two fifty nine than anybody else I've seen yet. He, he's actually the only one that I've seen that actually used it. Uh, he, um, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> he's. It's a good. It's a good look though. Yeah, good it is. He him. he rocks it well. Yep. Well, this next piece of video here, and this one's going to be uh, a little bit longer, too. This is of the Ameritron amplifier plant. And some things have changed there a little bit. I, I had some questions about it, and I was surprised at uh, some of the stuff I learned that well, that was different than, well, cool. than it was uh, 10 years ago. I'm here at Ameritron with Mike Enos. Mike, it's nice to meet you. Good to meet you, George. I'm glad to have y'all with us today. Well, I know Ameritron's got some new things, and we wanted to come over and take a look at some of it and see what y'all are building today. Okay. We're glad y'all come through. We'll, we'll make our way to the where we build our new products, give you a little bit of show of it, try to explain what it does and stuff to uh, show you what okay. we have new available. All we right. We can uh, make our way down this way. This is some of our production lines here. They're building the AL82, the AL1200 amplifier down this line uh, as we make our way. And we still do everything by hand over here. All of our components are hand placed, hand soldered, uh, and everything yeah. over here. And as we come around, this is a, another one of our lines that builds the AL80B amplifier, uh, the AL800H amplifier, and the 572. This here is the line we run our AL811, AL811H amplifier down. Uh, they start at this end with little pieces, and then when they get to that end, they, they look like this right here, and they'll go through testing. And So last time I was here, I think the AL811 was your most popular amplifier. Is that still the case? No. Uh, at the time, I think the tubes were more dominant over solid-state yeah. equipment at the time, and now we find in a solid-state is okay. more of a preference. Uh, newer hams, they don't want the the hassle of having to tune plate and load controls to resonate the tube. They just like to be able to turn it turn on and go. and operate. Yes, yeah. sir. And that, that's what we're seeing today is more more solid state being produced than the tubes are. Uh, we still have a lot of the tubes that still being produced though, because we still got hams that. You know, they want to keep that tradition going. Well, they used tubes back then. I want to try it myself. So <laughs> so we still have some that, that wants to continue yeah. using the tube type amplifier. Uh, this is some of our solid state stuff here. This is some of our uh, 600 watt amplifiers. Uh, now this, these run on HF. This is the original 600 watt amplifier. Solid yes, state you yeah, this is the original 600 watt amplifier, and then you also get the choice of which power supply you want to come mm -hmm. with it. Uh, we have a lightweight switching power supply, and then you can buy the linear that weighs a lot heavier than it. Really make uh, any difference? Doesn't make no difference. The switching will give you more uh, flexibility. Let's say if you plug it into your house wiring and your line voltage sags, the switcher adjusts for that, so you're continuing yeah. to make constant power, whereas the linear, if you're Line voltage sags, your power is going to sag on the output out to the antenna. Hmm. Uh, but as far okay. as performance wise, you know, we got good filtering inside the switching so you get no noise in your audio or nothing going out on the air. Uh, none of the hash noise that you hear, used to hear horror stories about years ago. Uh, then this is our mobile that we continue to be making. 500 watts, you can put this in your vehicle and operate HF. And then these devices here will allow it to interface to your radio for auto band changing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kept way everything's hands-free operation for you. This is our newest product. This is called our ALS 606 amplifier. Uh, and then this is 600 watts. 
It works from HF 160 all the way up through six meters, and it'll give you full 600 watts on all bands. And um, so, what's the difference between this one and you, your other 600 watt? Okay, the other 600 watt one, it doesn't have six meters on it. Okay. And also, there's a filter you have to buy and plug into to get it to operate on 10 meters. Okay. This is all microprocessor controlled, uh, so it monitors what frequency you're on. It, uh, it'll do auto band switching for you. Uh, so when you switch bands of your radio, it follows right along, so it's all hands-free. And 6 meters and 10 meters built in. There's no add-on kits or anything you have to put in here. Uh, also, our, our older designs, you notice we have the LEDs extruding right. through the mm -hmm. front of everything. So we try to change it up, make it a slick front, and use everything backlit indicators and stuff now. Um, so this is our 1306 amplifier, the ALS 1306. Same as the, the 600 watt one, except you can get 1200 watts out. Yeah. So we, uh, again, it works from 160 all the way up through six meters. I even get full 1200 watts out on six meter operations. Wow. Um, <clears throat> what we do here is we take the proven, the older amplifier, uh, it's been proven for reliability and performance, so we just take that same PA module and we install it in here uh, and get it to operate here. But for the 1200 watts, we take two of those modules, okay. combine them together, yeah. so we're running eight uh, MRF 150 MOSFET uh, FETs inside this one. So by combining two together, we had to come in and we use a splitter network here. So your radio mm -hmm. frequency comes in, we split it out, it goes into the two PA modules, and then this is our combiner network. It brings it back in, and then we feed it through our uh, high current uh, filtering circuit. So, so you can run heavy duty 160, 80 meters, uh, where high currents required a lot. You don't have to worry about any components heating up and breaking down. This unit also has a thermistors that monitors the FETs, also uh -huh. thermistors that monitors the heat sink temperature, and they're controlled, uh, fan controlled. So if you're operating sideband or CW, everything's gonna run constant. But if you get down and you're operating like some continuous modes, like you're running ready or slow scan or something like that, uh, instead of this thing just shutting off when it starts to get hot, it keeps you on the air and it will control the bias and the fan speeds to maintain operation all the time. Now it'll start to lower the power down yeah. uh, until it gets to a, a point that it can maintain itself. And that way you never disappear off the air. You're still there uh, making your contacts. And then we also have a uh, watt meter. It's a true peak reading watt meter when you're on okay. audio. Uh, sideband, it reads your true voice peaks. It's got your current meters to let you know what's going on inside amplifier, how much current the FETs are drawing. It also has your SWR ratio. It lets you know uh, how much SWR you have on your antenna. Mm -hmm. And then it's got a reflected scale also that will uh, tell you how much reflected power is on your antenna. So is the ALS 1300 and the 1306 the same except the auto band switching? Okay, the ALS 1300, you have to buy the 10 meter kit, okay. install it, and it does not have six meters. Uh, okay. so, so this one's been out for about 10 years now, and this here has mm -hmm. been the later model. So, so basically we took the 1300, uh, we had to do some stuff on the PA modules to get six meters on there, and everything's self-included into the uh, 1306. It already has your 10 meters, it already has your six meters, plus the radio interfacing uh, mm -hmm. stuff. Everything's built in, you just plug it into your radio and you're ready to operate. It does everything for you. It's hands-free operation. Uh, it has standby operate for those that wants to, you put the amp in standby and it's just sitting there idle. You can transmit barefoot straight out to your radio. And then when you want the amp, you just put it in operate mode. It's got LE uh, indicators here, backlit. Kind of gives you ideals if the amp, uh, if you're not in the right band or if you're not, it doesn't like your SWR or whatever. It's got little indicators that come up and tell you that you might need to check your antenna or something like that. Um, this is the power supply that comes with this one. Uh, it's a 50 volt, 50 amp power supply. Is that it's switching? Switching power supply. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, we do recommend to plug it into 240 volts because mm -hmm. uh, it can draw about 14 amps on 240. Uh, but for those guys that uh, they want to buy this now and run it on 120 until later on, they can get a 240 line to come into their shack. Uh, so they can switch the jumpers over and run it on 120. Uh, we just let them know it can draw about 25 amps on 120, but, mm -hmm. but a lot of customers will buy it and use it at low power, like six or 800 watts. And then once they get their 240 volt line come in, they'll switch it back over to 240. Mm -hmm. So so it's adaptable, whichever way you want to run it. So does the same supply work with either one of those amps, or do you have a different supply? It's the same power supply. It comes with both amps. And then we have the other uh, power supply we showed with the ALS 600 amplifier. It's the one that comes with the 606. You can still choose if you want the linear supply with the LS606 or the switching power supply. Uh, we can make our way back here and we can see one under uh, in operation if you okay. like. Of course, all of our units, we use foam, memory foam. Uh, this is what we, our amplifiers set inside this, so it's all surrounded by memory foam. That way if something crushes the box, the foam pops back in shape, so it maintains the uh, protection on the amplifier the whole time it's in transit to the customer. Ken is our tech guy that he does all of our testing and the QC of the 1306 amplifier and also the LS606 amplifier. Uh, here you see he's got it powered up. You can see we got backlit LED meters, lights up the back plate of the amplifier for us and we have it connected into the uh, ICOM radio here. And what it'll do is it, it shows you that you're in remote mode, so you're allowing your radio to override uh, the, wherever the band switch is on the amp. So as you go from band to band, it'll let you know which bands your radio is on and which band you're going to be operating. It also, let's say you want to override your radio for some reason, uh, once you take it out of remote, your, your manual switch will override what the radio is doing. Yeah. Um, then if you go to here, uh, like if he keys it up, can you transmit and show us putting some power out? See, we're putting out uh, 1,500 watts. We're on what band? 20? 20, 20 meters. So it's, it's, we're pretty conservative when we're at 1,200 watts output, but uh, we recommend 1,200 watts peak output on this thing. And how much um, power do you drive it with? There, he's probably driving it with, what you got, about, yeah, on 100 watts, usually about 80 watts of drive will give you 1,200 watts out on the bands, the bands. And then you got a little TX indicator that comes on. Uh, also, you have ALC control. If you want the ALC to control your radio power to control the output of the amplifier, you also have that available. Uh, it's got some, the fans are mounted. On this side, and it sucks air in. Like I said, they're temperature controlled, so they run low speed. And then, if they want us to begin to heat up, then they'll start cranking the speed up on the on the fans. So, I, I know this one is fairly new, but it's essentially the amplifiers themselves are the same chassis as uh, the 1300. Is that correct? The chassis is a little different. Um, due to we had to do some work for six meters. Mm -hmm. uh, so we had to change the PA up a little bit, the filtered circuit. We mm -hmm. had to add the extra coils. Uh, the third, this amplifier here has a control board. It's got a microprocessor monitoring and operating everything. Uh, whereas the 1300, it didn't have no mm -hmm. microprocessor. That's what allows us to be able to have 10 and, and six meters already in here. Yeah. Uh, before you couldn't ship a product out with 10 meters in it. Right. So the customer had to buy the filter and install it himself. So here the processor will detect, if you're in a frequency that's forbidden for ham radios to be using amplifiers on. Oh, that's how you got it, around it. That's then. how I you see. get around that. Okay. So, so if he was to tune in a CB frequency or something, that thing would flash and let you know it's a no-no yep. uh, to do that type thing. So, um, so how, how good a life are you seeing on these devices? You use the same device in all the amplifiers, right? Yes, sir. We're using the MRF-150, the MOSFETs, 
they've been proven over the years and years. Uh, you'll find that in a lot of your transceivers and a lot of a lot of different communication devices. Uh, that's why we want to stay with them mm -hmm. uh, because we we know you don't have to worry about them oscillating or going wild on you or mm -hmm. anything. So we're, that, we're just staying with those because it's a proven uh, thing, and we know the customer is not going to have any issues when they get it and operate it over the years. So are they? Do you see many come back for you know needing those replaced or? No, uh, sir. It's uh, it's rare. Uh, that we see some come back. Uh, sometimes we might see some come back, and it, I think a lot of it might be the construction of oh, the final more than itself. The yeah, and it, it just turned yeah. loose. Um, but mm -hmm. yeah, but normally if you have an issue, it shows up real quick uh, after you get yeah. a few hours of operation. Of course, we go through here. Well, each unit we put on the bench. We go through all the bands, make sure that the filters are tuned for each band. Uh, it makes full power, so. So each one has about an hour runtime on them before they go out of here. Mm -hmm. And uh, so normally when the customer gets it, they, they're ready to operate. When they get it, they just connect it up and off they go. This is our latest antenna controller. It's called an SDC-105. Uh, what this is, is this is so that if you're going mobile or you're using a screwdriver antenna, uh, this is our antenna, the SDA-100 antenna it's our screwdriver you mount it on your vehicle and you can cover 80 all the way up through six meters yeah uh, with this antenna i have one of these mounted on the outside of the building here um, out there and what we have here uh, there's no interface cables you need to your radio uh, what this box does is you hook this box in your coaxial line and it's just sensing rf as you operate uh, if i come in here and i like if I, uh, I'm on 14 megs, I key it up, it gives me an SWR ratio. Shows mm -hmm. I'm one to one. It tells me where my antenna is at. My antenna is on the 28th turn. And then it shows RF is present if I transmit. Now what will happen is, if let's say I want to go to 20 or 40 meters, I would come in here, um, I would give it a burst of RF. It would read my frequency, shows my radio frequency change to 726 meg. And then my SWR is 5.6. Uh, now what it is, right now I have it in manual mode because I don't want this thing to try doing anything unless I tell it to. Yeah. If I put it in auto mode and I've done that, it would automatically went to where it needs to be on the mm -hmm. antenna at the resonant point. <clears throat> but sometimes I'll band hop, move around, try to find right. out maybe where I want to be. Uh, once I do that, I'll give it a burst of RF. I say I'm going to be there. And then I say, okay, go, go ahead and tune that for me. So it's moving the antenna. If it's got to move a long distance, it will boost that voltage from 12 to 15 volts to get there faster. So you don't have to hold the mic down while no, it's No, I'm not tuning. using it. So it's on its way. Okay, it just stopped. Um, so it's now if I give it, say it shows it's 1.8. But if I want it to fine tune that, it'll then, bring it down to. Okay. So then I have to hold RL for it to fine tune it out and then it'll come down and then also as my antenna moves uh, if I go back to 40 if I boost it I want to show you too what it's all right it shows it's like 4.2 SWR all right I'm gonna hit tune as it's moving your antenna it's giving you how much current it shows I'm using almost two tenths of an amp of current okay and it shows my antennas in a downward direction with a D and it shows the turns as it going down so I can hear the audio coming in loud as I'm getting close yeah. then it stopped and then it's back at 1.1 SWR so that way it's all hands-free you just if you're going down the highway you just switch your radio give it a burst of power and it reads it and then boom it'll it'll take the antenna to where it needs to go to resonate now you do need to have a, a sensor in the antenna so it can count the turns because uh, it will try to tune if you don't have one mm -hmm. but what happens is, is these antennas uh, you can have five or six harmonics for each band to show up through that antenna and if it doesn't know where to start tuning yeah. it may tune up on the fifth harmonic which isn't good so so you would just kind of go through here and plot each band where you want that thing to tune at so i have a little tar hill too will the sensor in it work with this yes sir. okay it'll work with any of the tar heels anything that's got a sensor in the antenna it will, 
it'll work with any of those. That's just about nearly all your screwdriver antennas have yep. have a sensor yep. built into them. Now. Uh, retail cost is uh, it's going to be two forty nine for that. That's what it'll be, uh, and then you would just add that. Like I said, nothing to interface to your radio. You just hook it into your control box. Uh, it gives you your SWR reading. Now, also, we have a little mobile watt meter uh, that you've seen up front. If you want to get, you can plug into here, and it will show your forward power, reflected power, mm -hmm. and everything, too. You can add into that. We also build an amplifier for Mirage. Uh, we build the 2-meter, uh, the 150-watt output amplifier. We do all the testing here uh, for that. We have, a, uh, we have another... We build three different models. We have one that's a 5018, uh, which is this type here. And what we do is we have just the main board. And if you have a radio that puts out 50 watts and you can't turn it down, you can buy this model and it just has an attenuator built into it. Mm -hmm. That way it takes the 50 watts, drops it down to 25, and feeds it back through the main board. And then also some of these guys that's got HTs, Right. Um, they want to go mobile or whatever, and they want to boost their HT power up. We have another little amplifier module that plugs in place here, and that'll take your five watts of HT and boost it up to 150 watts output. Oh. And it's called the 1018 uh, model B 1018G. And this is all Mirage products here. And Mirage is for VHF and UHF bands. Yes, sir. Is that correct. Mm -hmm. That is correct. And then this is our real popular little item, the ARB704. Um, this is where she's building this up. Uh, the ARB704, <clears throat> a lot of your new transceivers, each transceiver has some type of DIN plug. It may be a 13 pin, it may right. be an 8 pin mm -hmm. mini, or it might be an 8 pin standard. Um, <clears throat> so a lot of people don't want to take the time to try to wire up those little pins and stuff. So we have this ARB704. <clears throat> this is the board. And we have a uh, five pin jack that we make an interface cable. And you can just call up, say I have this radio, and it'll have a, your mate to your radio you plug in, and then the other end plugs into here. And by using the five pin jack, your radio gives this thing the power and the relay control and the ALC that it will need to operate your amplifier. Hmm. So then you just take the other RCA then and you plug it right into the back of your amplifier. Now what's neat about this is it will work on AC voltage, it'll work on negative DC and positive DC. So some of your old Yaesu radios, the old Collins, yeah. had those big AC relays in there. You can plug this in line and it drops it down to like three volts at less than a milliamp of current that your transceiver will be operating. Saves the relay circuits in your transceivers. Uh, that's the ARB-704. That's neat. Uh, relay buffer box that we have. So that's that's pretty popular right now. That's huh? a popular. I think uh, everybody that has a newer radio, they they usually make sure they get one of those because that will that'll protect their radio for whatever amplifier they connect up to. And of course, here is our. Uh, this is where our packaging takes place after it goes through testing. Uh, you can see here they have a AL811 amplifier that went through testing earlier today. So they, mm -hmm. they get it all wrapped up in plastic. And then this is the uh, memory foam inserts. So that way it protects it from the bottom, protects it from all around the amplifier and also the sides. And this will go down into a, uh, a double wall cardboard box. And then that yeah. box will fit over into another box and yeah. got some more foam sticks around it so and y'all ship these with the tubes removed the 811 right? 811h we have the tubes inside oh um, all, mounted okay. already mounted and they what they do is they take it and they've got some uh, foam sheets that they uh i guess he's got it over there but they got some foam sheets yeah like like what he's got here they'll take this foam and they'll wrap the tubes and stuff up in there and that way they stay in their socket and they don't get okay. out loose because what we have determined is 811s you know 811 has got little springs on the top of them right that holds the filament up keeps it from sagging and we have found if you pack those up in a box a light box they kind of easier to get tossed around and the little springs will be vibrated out of there and they don't work so huh. so they travel easier inside the amp now our higher expensive tubes that's more rugged built. They have their own foam inserts and stuff because the manufacturer of those tubes, yeah. uh, they say if it's not in their original packing, then it boys their warranty. So 
those we have to ship in the war packing for those. Here's the uh, little 704 box we were looking at. Uh, they've got them packing them up. Uh, that's what it looks kind of like with the with the cover on it. And then of course all of our covers. Um, here's where we have an 811 powered up. He's in the process of testing it now. Uh, this is kind of, I'm going to just kind of raise it up so you can see the tubes glow. Uh, that's where a lot of hams like to see. They like yeah. to see the glow of the tubes. <laughs> that's why a lot of them won't still use glass tubes. You can watch them glow and you put a little RF in there and they'll glow a little orange. You know, you can watch right. the coloration mm -hmm. change. Um, so this is our three tube 811 amp here. And then of course it's got an interlock. If I was to lift the cover up, it would instantly right. shut this yeah. thing down. Uh, but uh, this is going through the testing process now. On the rear panel, it's got tuned input slugs so that uh, you have a lot of hams uh, that may use the Mars frequencies also. And you can tune their inputs to match your marine type radios, mm -hmm. marine and Mars. Then all of our covers, of course, when they come over, they we use a vinyl cover uh, instead of a painting. Mm -hmm. uh, years ago, we tried using paint, and when it bends, it, the paint might crack, or years right. down the road, the paint might crack, or it begins to fade out or something. And uh, so we use a vinyl overlay. That way it stretches. You never have to worry about paint fading or chipping or cracking or anything. So that that is interesting oh. that the solid state apps are, are finally the biggest sellers, you know, because it was not that way last time I toured here. No, sir, know. it was not. Uh, a lot of it, too, is the cost of the tubes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, they've gone up and up and up, so now the solid state is competitive in pricing. Uh, so a lot of people say, why do I want to spend the same amount of money for a tube when I can get a solid state and, yep. and I just turn it on and go, kind of, kind of like the old TVs, you know, you don't no longer get up and go over and change the channels on your TV no more, so that's, that's what the market's moving into. Yeah. The, the more easier it is to operate, that's, that's what they want. Well, it's probably... Honestly, it's probably a little more reliable too, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah, you have reliability. Less things can go wrong. Uh, less human error, on, especially when you're DXing and yeah. up all night trying to make that one more contact. And the solid state will it'll protect itself and keep up better than you can what you're doing type of thing a lot of times. So. Yeah. Well, Mike, we appreciate you talking with us. Oh, yes, sir. I'm glad y'all came by. Sure did. And thank y'all for coming. and. Y'all just keep on making the good amplifiers. Yes, sir. We'll, we should be around a whole long time, I'm hoping. <laughs> yes, sir. And just uh, keep supplying the customers what they need. That's what we're here yep. for. Yes, sir. All right. 73. All right. 73. Solid state is the new it. Solid state is, the, yep, the new amplifier king. I, you know, I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I see I why. I see it kind of turning that way, maybe. It, it makes a lot of sense that people would want solid-state amplifiers today. I'm kind of wanting that ALS uh, 1306. See, there you go. I almost, I I had the money with me. I'll put it that way. I'll, well, no, I didn't. I had a checkbook with me. That's all it takes. Yeah. No matter if you got any money, if you got a check. Yeah. So, uh, anyway... I, d I didn't buy it, but I'm getting have. closer. I'm getting closer. We got. Well, we wait until the next Jackson Ham Fest. Mm, probably at this point. Yeah. That's only uh, three months away. Yeah. Wow. That's well, that doesn't fast. seem right, does it? No, but it is right. Yeah. Well, that was well, pretty cool. I uh, I wish I could have gotten over there to see that, but. Uh, I guess I just did. You did. Mm -hmm. And it was a little different than than the one that we showed uh, 10 mm -hmm. years ago that I recorded then. Uh, you've got another thing that you shot here that uh, we played in the last episode of Amateur Logic. Yeah, some new stuff that uh, MFJ and uh, a partner are going to have coming out pretty quick. Yeah, that's just, I, I got a little clip of that just to remind folks, go back, watch episode 109. 
for uh, more information on the rig pie. All right, we got some exciting raspberry pie action going on here at uh, MFJ uh, Anniversary. Uh, what's your name? My name is Howard Nurse. My call is W6HN. The program uh, uses open source software. Uh, it will be available completely open to anybody that wants it and wants to tweak on it, but it includes the Hamlib uh, software library. So it supports over 200 radios, over 60 manufacturers. This is a uh, collaboration that of uh, many hams that have put together the ability to control lots of radios and makes con- uh, uh, making the, it makes contact uh, connecting to radios very easy. Uh, there are two boards that MFJ will be manufacturing: the a uh, CW board for. Uh, that uses the very popular K1EL WinKey chip. The second board is an audio board, RigPi server, and what's important is that it's really a ham radio server. Yeah, go back and watch the full interview with them and the full demonstration mm-hmm. on the previous amateur logic, like you said. But it's pretty cool stuff. I'm looking forward to that coming out. Yeah, if if you didn't see uh, episode 109 and see the Rig Pi on there. You really want to go look at it because there's a there's also kind of like a little Easter egg mm-hmm. in in that segment. Too. Yeah, yeah, he had uh, he he had a little bit of interesting history about yep. him. So, so very cool stuff. Go check that out. And now we've got one. Well, we've actually got two more clips. One is real brief, but uh, this one but right this here. This one of the more important ones. Yeah, this is the dude. The oh, main man. This is man. the main man. Yep. Uh, had the opportunity to visit with Martin Jew in his home environment again, uh, right there in his office, and just have a chat about what has changed with MFJ over the past 10 years since the last time we shot an interview. Go back and watch that first one because um, the same stuff is not in this one, and you're going to miss an awful lot yeah. um, about the history uh, that, that won't be in this one. But this this is all great stuff right here, and it's great to catch up with him and, you know, find out what's going on. Ten years ago, I sat in this office right here and talked with Martin Jew, the founder of MFJ Enterprises, about how the company got started, uh, some of the stories over the years. And, you know, in ten years' time, well, I, maybe I forgot a few things, and I'm sure some things have changed, too, so we're going to do it again. Martin? Thanks for being with us here today. Well, thank you for coming uh, down to visit us. And uh, um, uh, you're right, some things have changed, but um, some things and that stack of paper over there is probably probably the same stack that was there 10 years ago. Don't you think so? It could be, <laughs> I guess. The office does look a little neater than the, the last time I was in here. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I spent the last several days cleaning out all the junk that I had all over my office. And after I got through cleaning, I found a floor down there. <laughs> <laughs> so there was something under it all anyway. Yeah. Uh, do you still use the same note-keeping system? Tell us about that. Well, you know, in engineering school, we were always taught to keep a notebook. So over... Behind me, there's a stack of notebooks that goes back from my days as a student. And uh, whenever I come up with an idea or have a conversation with someone, I, I keep keep some notes. And uh, I used to record every telephone call that I had. So I got a room full of notebooks. <laughs> wow. So... 45 years worth of notebooks would be quite a lot. Do you keep them all here, or have you had to lease out storage to <clears throat> well, put some in? Well, they're just kind of stacked under the desk, and <laughs> they're, they're everywhere. <laughs> yeah. And do you remember where everything is in them? Well, you know, I like to tell everybody that, but, you know, I don't always say things that are always accurate. I also notice, of course, you've got a... Nice collection of vintage gear in here, and I think that has grown since the last time I was here as well. Well, it has. I've got uh, as many radios as I can stack on the top shelf. 
of all these bookcases into bookcases and then behind that set of bookcases there there's two more stacks of radios on top of bookcases on the other side and there's some more radios that's uh, on uh, stacked on the top of the shelf in that room and then the extra radios are out there in the hallway so it won't be long before i have to move out of the office <laughs> <laughs> so some of them you've got more than one of a particular model you you've got backups i have got so many backups you know when i find a deal on a radio i just buy it and um i don't know why but i might have four five six of the same thing <laughs> <laughs> what would you say was is one of the uh the more favorite recent finds <clears throat> um well i tell you the there's two radios that um uh, I'm very proud to have. Um, one of them is a, um, remember the very first transistor radio that was ever made for the consumer market, and it was made by a company called Regency. They yeah. brought out, mm -hmm. uh, it was a four transistor radio, pocket size, and this was back around, I think, 1954, 1956. Well, they brought out a the very first piece of equipment for the ham radio market, and what it was was a uh, mobile converter. Back then, when you operated mobile, you use your AM broadcast station as the receiver, and the converter would convert those bands down uh, to the so you can receive it on your radio. And I mean, it had. The converter had built-in BFO, so you could receive Morse code. Uh, but that was a really good find. And the other one was a uh, set by Helicraft that looked exactly like a S38 receiver. It was a low-cost receiver made in the 40s and the 50s. Mm -hmm. But this uh, was a S38 but it also had a transmitter that was built into it, had an extra tube for the oscillator, and then used the uh, audio amplifier output stage tube for the final amplifier in the transmitter, and the controls for the transmitter was on the back, and it was called the SR-75, and the SR uh, designated a receiver and a transmitter. Wow. So they did pull double duty with with that one tube then <clears throat> that well yeah with that uh, audio output stage was not only output stage for the audio but also for the transmitter mm. yeah so <clears throat> on the regency you were talking about a moment ago that was the first solid state piece of ham radio <clears throat> gear first solid state piece of ham radio gear had one transistor in it and I remember the transistor number was the SB100, and that was a very early uh, VHF transistor. Hmm. Yeah. Well, you got so many in here. I'm going to just take a stab and say maybe you got more Heathkit than anything else, but I, I may not be right. Do you know which? <clears throat> well, probably Heathkits. I mean, you know, all of us when we were... During that era, we every, all of us built Heath kits. You know, that was the only way us as young hams could afford uh, uh, factory equipment uh, radios. Uh, now there's also some uh, night kits, and uh, but those were the two big uh, kit company back then. There were a few others. There was Ico. There was some, uh, I don't know if Lafayette had kits. I think they were mostly built. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so, do you get any new gear at all, or do you just always grab the vintage radios when you see them come along? Well, I mean, um, I have got lots of uh, new radios, um, but I don't turn them on very much. <laughs> it's just too easy to make contacts with a new radio. Um, yeah. But I've got um, 
Let's see, ICOM 7300, a KX3, KX2, KX1. Oh, so you got some real modern stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I've got a Pro 7562. Anyway, whole whole list of them. But that's operating those compared to the way that we used to operate where we had a separate receiver and a separate transmitter and, and you had to remember to switch your antenna from your transmitter to your receiver um, um, and make sure you tuned it all up and I mean you know with all these radios the old ones that I bought I'm, I'm trying to create the thrill that I used to have as a novice and you know that's that's hard to recreate with a new radio I bet the new ones are sort of like shooting fish in a barrel, I guess. Yeah, and yeah. The old ones, you really had to work at it. It was an accomplishment when you had a QSO, I guess. Yeah, no, those were the days. That yeah. was, that was, uh, you know, being a young ham, you, you know, you just didn't have much money. And, and I remember taking, uh, back in those days, we didn't have good magnets. So mm -hmm. the speakers were electrodynamic speakers. And, right. And well, what that meant, and I know you know, is that piece of iron with wire wrapped around it to make an electromagnet, and they use that also as a filter choke. So you could take uh, an old radio with an old speaker like that and unwind that wire and use it for an antenna wire. <laughs> <laughs> the problem was that was soft copper and it didn't it wouldn't stay up there very long because it would sag and break and yeah. constantly uh, changing tuning as it went i guess yeah yeah you're right it did wow <laughs> i never thought about that that's uh that's something to consider when you're hanging an antenna is, yeah. <laughs> is that wire gonna stretch so of course you studied engineering at Mississippi State and uh, and at Georgia, you got your master's at Georgia Tech, yeah. Georgia Tech. Mm -hmm. So, is that all you need to to start up a ham radio mm -hmm. business and be successful at it, or is there some other background you got that kind of contributed? Well, you know, you really don't need an engineering degree. The mo the most important ingredients, I think, is what I call want to. Mm -hmm. If you got enough want to, if you got enough desire, you're gonna make something happen because if you didn't if you fail the first time, you just get back up and do it again. You got enough want to, you just keep on doing it doing it until something happens. And and usually from what I've seen the way businesses um or, you know, they start off with small sales and it just kind of rocks along for a long time with small sales. And, um, you know, if you can get to the point where you're at break even, you can stay around forever. Now, if you can get just slightly above break even, then you can eat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but if you keep doing it long enough, you're going to find something that somebody wants. And then when that happens, it starts to take off. And that's what happened to us. It took us three, four years, uh, you know, we were making enough to do pretty good, but it all of a sudden we added an antenna tuner and also a toll-free watch telephone line. And that was in November of one of the early years. And uh, in that one November, we sold more in that one month than we did in the entire previous year. Wow. So we would, it would do like that. Yeah. So the the tuner really, that was the breakthrough product. Then, the huh? tuner was the breakthrough, and the marketing using that tow free watch line. We put that tow free watch line all the way across the top, and we were the second ham radio company to have a tow free watch line. Wow, <laughs> and and y'all believe in advertising a lot too. I see the MFJ advertisements everywhere. You're a sponsor mm -hmm. on Amateur Logic. And, of course, we really appreciate it. But people got to know who you are and what you got. Well, that's the whole point. You know, advertising, uh, you know, people think advertising is some big-time magical thing. 
uh, all advertising is just letting people know what you got. You know, if, if they don't know what you got, how are they going to buy it? You know? That's true. Yeah. That's true. So how many ham fest a year do you think uh, MFJ well, attends these days? Well, you know, at one time we were going to like 45 ham fests a year. Now, uh, I think we've cut down to about 22, 25 a year and... I used to go to all of them, uh, but you know you get old and lazy and and decrepit and all that. So, <laughs> so I let the young guys go to. I go still go to a few of them that. Yeah. Uh, but when I go, I just go out there and have a good time and. Oh, you got old, old. <clears throat> yeah. And just rummage around and at the. Um, um, flea markets and just mm -hmm. buy all these old radios. That's what I like to see is the flea markets. But at any ham fest there is, there's going to be MFJ products there whether MFJ brought them or not because virtually every amateur radio dealer out there sells MFJ, don't they? I yeah, can't think of yeah. any that don't. Yeah. yeah my, my, most, most of the dealers uh, sell MFJ products. We're in uh, over 35 countries uh, directly, and then some of the dealers that are in those countries sell to dealers in other countries. Wow. Yeah. So you don't really know how many countries for sure you might be in. Well, for sure we don't. You know? Yeah. Well, and I notice a lot of the products you got um, are, are, I guess, commodity type products a lot of things are built right here in Starkville Mississippi uh, in your factories well 90 percent of the products are made here in Starkville and some of them uh, we don't make uh, there are things like clocks and microphones and uh, some watches and those kind of products mm -hmm. uh, but we can um, build uh, all the circuit boards here. I mean, we'll design the products, lay out the PC board. Uh, we have a surface map machine for placing the parts. We've got a metal shop where we uh, can make all the electronic enclosures. We make some of the big plastic parts, uh, for uh, vacuum form parts for mm -hmm. loop antennas and the uh, outside antenna tuners. And um, we have, we own all the dyes for the injection molding, but the injection molding is done by a local guy here in town. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I guess the amount of that you would do, it wouldn't make sense to to own and maintain a machine if you've got somebody nearby that can. Yeah, it do takes, it for that's you. a big operation to do injection molding. Yeah. yeah. But you have, and and we're going to take some tours while we're here of some of the the various factories that you've got. A lot of specialty uh, gear and rigs built just for a single purpose, to do a single job that, uh, you know, otherwise it would take forever to do by hand. And <clears throat> precision, you know, you, I've kind of got it down to a science on that. A, a lot of that stuff was the concept and design done right here just to, to build what you needed? Uh, yeah, most of the, well, all the concept, well, most of them are done right here in Starville. Uh, the design, a lot of the, the design is done here. We do some of it here, and we have, and these are our employees. They're, uh, they don't live here in Starville. It's just hard to get people to come to Starville, so... Mm -hmm. But the design they can do uh, at home somewhere else, and we've got some uh, some engineers in Jackson, in New Jersey, in Georgia, in Maine, um, in New Hampshire. Um, so they do the uh, the circuit design, the design, the actual design of the products, mm -hmm. and then we finish them up here, uh, put them into production. You know, we may get a raw design, and then we have to tweak it up and make sure all the parts fit in there right, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, and I know this has probably changed over the years, what what would be your your favorite project right now? What are you most uh, 
enthusiastic about at the moment? Um, in remote control of radios. And uh, we're working um, uh, with some people to uh, come up with a box that's universal that you can plug into a radio and be able to operate your radio that's at your home using your antenna over the internet using a computer and making it simple enough uh, to be called plug and play. So uh, e even uh, uh, wherever you have internet and a computer, you can enjoy your home station. And even with a hot spot in your car, you'll be able to operate mobile. So that's what I have been playing with. And I think, uh, you know, most of the new radios are capable of being remoted. Wow. Uh, well, I know there's there's been several things around now for a few years and a lot of people playing with that but i don't think much of it has been plug and play up to this point it's well it's you're right at this point you really have to know some stuff to get a remote going i mean you you have to you have to know how to um port for it in your router you have to know how to um open up firewalls and mm -hmm. your computer you know, you have to have a static IP. There's just so much stuff that you have to know. And it takes hours, days, weeks just to get something working. Yeah. yeah. I, I know I've been there and uh, I deal with that quite often. Everything's got to be just right. Uh, if you get it all just right, it works like a charm. Oh, but one yeah. thing gets off and nothing, yeah. Yeah. nothing works. It's really difficult trying to troubleshoot it trying yeah. to figure out yeah so how many different companies does mfj enterprises comprise of these days well it's six major one and then we have some smaller ones that we don't really advertise too much but uh six six major ones mm -hmm. and uh we're we're going to add some more shortly so that would be MFJ, uh, uh, Ameritron, Maritron. High Gain, Cushcraft, Vectronics, Mirage, mm -hmm. and we have a smaller uh, rotator company that's different oh. from uh, what High Gain makes. Okay. Uh, yeah. And I notice you're starting to represent um, some other companies yeah. now as yeah. well, distributing yeah. some uh, other unique products. That yeah. Well, we are the exclusive distributor for Malesi and Poloni coax that's made out of Italy and it is a very premium, very high quality, very low loss coax. And um, uh, you wouldn't believe how uh, low the losses are compared to some of the other uh, coax. Yeah, I was talking with uh, Richard about that in Huntsville and uh the stuff weighs nothing. I've never seen anything like yeah. it before. It's just amazing. Yeah, very, very, very lightweight. And uh, we also, they also have a connector that by itself is pretty waterproof. Hmm. And uh, anyway, it, it's a really a premium line of coax. Sounds like some of those guys have done their homework. Yeah, yeah. That's great. Well, yeah. they have been making coax since 1945, so they oh. know what they're doing. <laughs> okay. All right. And antenna-wise, there's another company that uh, mm. you're representing here in the U.S. as well that looks kind of innovative. <clears throat> well, actually, um, he has a company called Innovate Antenna in England, mm -hmm. and he has been down here designing a line of antennas. These are very high performance antennas, but they're antennas that we're going to manufacture using uh, the tooled up parts that we make at high gain. So they're going to be high gain antennas, uh, but designed by Justin Johnson, K0 
KSC. And he's, he's a world-known designer of high-performance antennas. And we've got a whole new line. We've got a, uh, an, an, an incredible, uh, it's called a band-optimized log periodic. And it's a big antenna, and it covers 20 meters through 6 meters, all the bands. Hmm. And it has monoband performance on every one of the bands. It's unlike a normal log periodic where the band where the gain is low. Yeah. And also we have a whole line of uh, loop fed arrays, uh, which are very very quiet compared to um, conventional antennas because it doesn't have any side lobes. You can put the loop fed array and compare it directly with a conventional antenna and even though signal strength is the same you can hear the signal out of the loop fed antenna but you can't hear it in the conventional antenna because of the noise yeah 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 it's not necessarily the signal level it's a signal to noise that is is what really matters in hearing something and not yeah i i've saw those antennas uh that he is, he has built, and yeah, you know, loops are known for being a little bit quieter. And I'd never thought about you know building a Yagi with that as a driven element before, but uh, yeah. it apparently it works pretty good. Yeah, it makes a big difference. We have a video on our website where you can see the comparison between the two. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can actually hear a signal and switch it over to the other antenna. You can't hear the signal, but you can see that the signal strength are the same in both of them. Yeah. Ham radio companies, and I say companies, a lot of them are just individuals, are always coming and going. A guy gets a, an idea for a new product, and it may really work well, and he wants to go into business selling it. And um, I would say the vast majority never get very far because there's just so much involved in it is not just having the good idea but being able to execute it and and follow through would you say anything to those guys that uh, maybe you know feel like uh, like they've got the next great idea and what they should do with it well uh, um, you know if you have enough want to and if you're young you don't have any uh, expensive things that you need to support like house payment or or kids or then you can devote all your time and your whole life until it starts to take off you know? <laughs> and that's pretty much you have to do it to yeah. get off the ground huh? yeah. yeah yeah that's uh it's and it's not just ham radio business just about every business is like that you know if you don't start off young when you don't have anything, and if it doesn't work, you still don't have anything. Um, it, it's kind of hard to start later in life because you know you got so much yep. responsibility that you can't afford to fail. Yeah, you know? I, I know, <laughs> know what you mean. That's uh, good advice there. So you young guys out there with the ideas, need to get started now. Don't put it off twenty or thirty years. Well, anything else you'd like to to mention that we haven't covered? Uh, well, we've covered a lot of uh, things, and uh, I just want to thank our fellow hams for uh, helping us to get to where we are, and all of our employees. We have have employees that've been with us for over forty years now. So, wow! Yeah, yeah. Well, congratulations on uh, 45 years here in Thank the ham you. radio business. There's not many people that, uh, and many companies that make it that long, and we're certainly proud to have you all right here in Starkville, Mississippi, and uh, seeing you, you, you know, just come up with an idea and uh, have enough want to to pull it off. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate you saying that, George, and it's, Always a pleasure to sit down with a fellow Mississippian that talked like we all talk down here. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I, Wayne has given us a thumbs up over there. He agrees too. All right, Martin. Well, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's just getting started here, so I got more to see. Okay. But I appreciate you taking a few minutes out here and, uh, and just chatting with us today and uh, kind of bringing us up to date on what's going on. Well, I appreciate it too. Uh, what can you say, man? He, he's always so laid back. Like, yeah. I don't think he ever gets worked up about anything. I, I haven't seen him. I don't think so either. And, <clears throat> you know, um, it's always great visiting with him. Mm -hmm. You know, I learn something every time. Yeah, he's an interesting guy. He is. You and gotta, he's, he's right, too. you got to have the want to. Gotta but you also got to have some can do also have to you go with it. A can of do is <laughs> <laughs> what you're saying. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I think he was right about the uh, young part. It's very difficult mm -hmm. if you've already got a family and, you know, oh, yeah. uh, responsibilities to, to try to start up a company. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it, uh, you really got to have that stability when you got other people relying yeah. on you. Exactly. So... Uh, G great information there, and we thank Martin so much for taking the time out and visiting with us because, you know, he's a busy guy. Oh, yeah. And, no uh, it, well, boy, we just, we just had a great weekend up there. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Uh, he says it's the last one, but we'll see. I, I'm, I bet you they'll have a. I I think he one said more. the last one was the last one. Yeah, that's what I heard somebody yeah, else saying. So, so. Hopefully yep. it's not the last one. Yep, we'll be there for the 50th. If he has it, we'll be there. Yep. Uh, well, you know, we've got a double feature we're working on tonight. We're about to start up an episode of Ham College here in just a moment. Uh, Tommy and I were having such a good time watching those long-form videos and not having to talk or do anything that uh, we went and got a pizza and you know, been <laughs> <laughs> yep. kicked gonna back here. have to get here. to work here in a few minutes, though. So. Yep. Yep, we're going to have to. Tonight... Ham's eating pizza, but at the MFJ, what what were we eating? Chicken. Well, I made it here where the chicken is finally. There's quite a line. I hadn't found George yet. I got a funny feeling he's already got his and come through the line. But there's quite a turnout here. A lot of people. Just as I suspected, he already found the chicken and found a place to sit. But anyway, I'm going to try to catch up. And you did catch up. So I finally got my piece of chicken. I didn't have to wait for you to bring one back for me. <laughs> That's a good thing, too. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you would have made it this time, either. There were a lot of hams eating chicken there. Oh, yeah. It was it was great food, yeah. man. They, uh, they really put on the spread for everybody. Oh, they so did. A yeah. lot of people. And it was free. Yeah. All, the whole weekend was... It's yeah. free. It, it was great. If you if they do have another one and you have the opportunity to go, I would suggest going for sure because it's definitely worth the trip. Yeah, or even if you're in the Starkville area anytime and you've never been there, uh, give them a call and, and see if they'll, you know, take a few minutes and show you around. Uh, mm -hmm. I think they do that. Oh, yeah. You know, throughout oh, that's cool. The year. I didn't realize that. But that'd be um, good. You know, if you need something, uh, some parts or something like that, they got parts. Yeah, so. I uh, I know they've. Uh, I saw them uh, saying somebody actually brought their gear in for some service. Really, I don't know how often they do that, but may, it may have just been a thing for the show. Oh. But I know they did. No, I, well, I think uh, local people may do that. Yeah, you know, it's kind, kind of interesting. Then driving distance. Well, we hope you've enjoyed this bonus episode of Amateur Logic tonight. Uh, you know, we had the footage. We've been wanting to get it out, and uh, we just said, let's let's put together just a, a separate episode and just put all the stuff we got at MFJ into it. Yeah, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. We we definitely enjoyed going. Yep. And uh, hopefully we'll go to one more at least. Uh, uh, Ed, yeah, and another one after that. All right, thanks for being here. We will see you all again, uh, well, around the 15th of the month. Yep, 73, everybody. 73.
he said. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> that, that was the that was the cue. For, and that's uh, when I lost it. That, <laughs> that, just, just right there. Yeah. <laughs> We're still live. You'll edit that out. Oh. Yeah, we'll edit yeah. all this out. We'll right. edit all that Get the out. blooper now. Yeah, we're at the blooper field. Yeah. So don't yeah. let me say, I can say anything right now. Yeah, you can say anything and nobody would ever know the <laughs> difference.